uh, from a uh, bit of chilly but sunny uh, morning in the UK and uh, to all our uh, worldwide uh, viewers watching this live webinar organized by NWA with Ortho TV UK and uh, with some help from uh, Primary Trauma Care Foundation. Uh, thank you for joining us on the uh, Sunday. Now, you can see from the program, we've got a, a very special webinar. Uh, it's special to me as well, uh, as I've been appointed as an ambassador for Primary Trauma Care Foundation. And having done my initial training from Sion Hospital in Mumbai, which is the busiest trauma center, uh, the trauma management sits very close to my heart. Uh, we've got uh, Nigel here from the PTCF. We've got Lard, sir. We've got Mulinda coming from Malawi and uh, Dr. Tharal joining us as well. And as you can see, the, the speakers we have on these webinars got extensive experience uh, in managing a trauma. They come from different parts of the world, share different experience with <clears> us. <throat> And hopefully this webinar will shed some light how we can improve the trauma care worldwide. And as you can see, uh, Nigel calls this as a forgotten pandemic, which he would explain during his uh, talk. Uh, there are you know, more than 6 million people die because of the trauma worldwide, which is probably more than what we've seen in the COVID times. And hence this webinar will allow us to understand why and how we can as a healthcare profession <clears throat> make difference to other humans' lives. Now, as a part of this webinar, uh, the viewers can use the Slido button, which is uh, 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 there available and ask questions. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it on to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashish Fadnis, who's gonna introduce a large sir, and then we can start the webinar. Ashish, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ravi, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone from uh, India. Uh, Dr. Lard, sir, is one of the foremost and what we would say the father of trauma care in the country. To introduce him, I am honored and it's uh, really a privilege to welcome him to this webinar and he has consented to be a part of it on a Sunday when he's extremely busy. Dr. Lard uh, is attached to the Sushusha uh, Citizens Cooperative Hospital and uh, his own Dr. Lard uh, clinic. He is the ex-professor and the head of the department of the LTM Medical College and the Sion Hospital, which is one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. He is a past president of the Indian Orthopedic Association and the Indian Arthroplasty Association. He is an honorary member of the Indian Society of the Hip and Knee Surgeons. And he is an ex-trustee of the AO Trauma Foundation, Switzerland from 1992 to 2002. He is an international AO faculty member for basic and advanced course in Delhi, Mumbai and various parts of uh, Asia, including Singapore, Hong Kong and Malaysia. Uh, he received the Padma Bhushan Award by the President of India and the BC, Dr. B.C. Roy National mm -hmm. Award in 1996 by the President of India, made Dr. Shankar Dayal Sharma. He has got an honorary doctorate of science conferred upon him by the Kal University. He's got a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Visitex Foundation, by Sanchiti uh, Institution, and a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Indian Orthopedic Association. He's also got a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Ranaut Orthopedic Research Foundation and Dr. B.N. Sinha Militaris Award of the Indian Orthopedic Association in 2013. Uh, his list of honorary fellowships, awards go on and on and on. Uh, we are really proud to have you, sir, here uh, participating with us. And to tell you on a personal note, Dr. Lard has been instrumental in establishing a very successful and a very vibrant trauma center which still serves the population of Mumbai and everyone surrounding Mumbai where patients from far and wide take their uh, sort of take the advantage of the system and Dr. Lard is going to take us through the evolution of trauma care in our country. Over to you sir. Thank you Ravi for inviting me and thank you Ashish for uh, introducing me. I think he has been a good old doctor for many years. I think um, it's wonderful again to come back in the younger generation to participate. And uh, you can imagine how old I am because I retired in 1995 at the age of 58. What I'm going to share with you is the down the memory lane of trauma care as a student of trauma care in a hospital in Mumbai. Uh, Nigel said about Mother, this lady. Yes, okay, the COVID-9 break outbreak went under control because there is a vaccine. 
And we feel that uh, mutation will come, but we can still have a vaccine. Can we have a vaccine for this? I don't think. It's very difficult to control because of the human behavior at right driving and business control and money making and a powerful lobby. Uh, I qualified in 1962 and opted my master's in 1966. I did a residency from 62 to 66, but trauma care as a concept was not understood during our time. The trauma care was an individual uh, specialty sort of hobby, mainly between two surgical disciplines, general surgery and orthopedic surgery. And the general surgeons still claimed that they were good orthopedic surgeons. The role of anesthetists, which in my opinion today, in early stages was not understood. Hence, I feel that trauma care was in a flux. This is Mumbai, and this is where the hospital is located. At the termination of Eastern and Western Express highways, it's very close to the main Central Harbor Railway lines and to the international airport. So it's a gateway to the city. And gateway to the city, any accident is to bring it there. So that's where I worked. We all know that this is never going to end. Let me say, that never going to end. So what you've got to do is try to prevent it and try to put in protocols which can reduce the specified challenges, death, disability, and function. What changed my understanding about 50 years ago? 1916, 13th of June, two suburban commuter railways collided head on in a torrential monsoon between two stations in Mumbai, killing 57, injuring 106, and 42 seriously. Now, these 57 were the dead bodies we found that had torso to upper limbs and lower limbs. How many more died? I don't know. The motorman cabins and four few coaches of both trains were crushed. The coaches were telescoped into each other and climbed over the engine coaches. How to salvage? How to cut them? How to bring them out? How to save? It was thought that it would monsoon might have disrupted. This was reported by Singapore Times. Our experience that time was 10 continuous days of working, surgery, three weeks of rehabilitation program and unique effort by all the physicians. And mind you, to work as a team without any departmental differentiation. That's I first learned as to how you can manage trauma. So the instantaneous recognition of a strategic position at the entrance of Mumbai city. This is the hospital that time. It is a big university union hospital now. I realized that time India was under Indian revolution. It was one ten of the world. It had 1% of the vehicles and one sixth accidents. Unfortunately, that time, Mumbai, India reported 110,000 deaths. 10 times million were injured. And we saw accidents like this, whole truck falling down. How do you do this salvage? To write, add to over this, we had industrialization, urbanization, mechanized transport, urban violence, social conflicts, and then later on, terrorism, disaster, both man-made and natural. Imagine what happened in 30 years. Two vehicle population increased by 11,500%, car by 700%, buses by 750%, trucks by 750%, and agriculture 300%. Trauma had mechanization has reached the villages. Are we prepared? And we had a vulnerable population. So we had a big challenge. And challenges were many. What was the impact of trauma that time? It was number one killer below 40 years. As a working person, high mortality and morbidity, lifelong disability in head and spinal injuries, and understand main soul bread earner, which affected an individual, family, and society. So you have to look at a trauma, in, it's not in isolation, but overall understanding what it is. This person was traveling over a truck 
and the truck went down a beach and this man was thrown out. So, as I said, not only high mortality, but increased morbidity. And look at what has happened to him after three months. He's still in bed. So, there's a misdiagnosis leading to high morbidity, a permanent disability, and salvage is very difficult. 21% disabled for life and man ever lost. So, the human loss was huge. What we realized that we need to have organization policy concept. Our hospital that time had a place named casualty. I used to call him casualty department. That means it's say some corner in the hospital. The doctor sitting there was not trained. The sister had just, just come back from her delivery and ward boys half the time drunk. What was necessary? We need to change the terminology from EMS to accident emergency service. You have to specify into two areas, and that's what we tried way back 54 years ago. Pre-hospital care and hospital care. And we involved police and fire brigade. Police would raise the alarm and have contact, and fire brigade would do salvage. And our hospital care was divided into advanced, basic, and core. Transportation and treatment was done by paramedics, and that was the need of the hour. So what did we do? Of course, this was not the right vehicle. This is not the right people. But then we had to start somewhere. What was our feeling? That if we have during transportation maintenance, and I'm talking about multiple injuries. I'm not talking about isolated fractures. But even isolated bilateral DBL fractures need to be looked into. And if we do three main things, airway breathing maintenance, we, we felt it would lead to gross reduction in mortality, then morbidity, and if you do all that, it could reduce a lifelong disability. So in hospital care, we laid down that primary consideration is for life salvage, limb salvage, and functional salvage. So for multiple injuries, first two, and for orthopedic injuries, functional salvage. What is the concept? The concept of composite, continuous, collaborative care which are based on injury analysis, monitoring, priorities, protocols, progress, and documentation. And we used to analyze our failures and death rate where we learned about misdiagnosis. So you always learn about excellent documentation. In 1971, 53 years ago, 52 years ago, we established first emergency trauma care ward. And you had trauma surgeon, three tip specialties, orthopedics, general surgery, and anesthesia, not working as individual residents, but as trauma residents. So this is our ward. You see a crash trolley, a well-trained sister, and first reception. That's a primary look. So after the pre-hospital alarm, we could have a primary look. So we had a reception with primary first look resuscitation. And our aim was is a restoration of airway, breathing, circulation, hemorrhage control, and stability, systemic and skeletal. But first three were most important, and that was continuously monitored. So before our trauma ward, our only source of monitoring was the blood pressure and pulse, which in even the new concept has no meaning at all. Bring the pulse rate down and restoring the blood pressure doesn't mean anything in trauma. Now you have a state of art monitoring, which was now after so many years, but that time we used to have more of a patient, individual patient care. So far as orthopedics is concerned, which is my specialty, as a person, I said, let the residents know which are limb threatening fractures, mainly multiple opal fractures, multiple fractures, a neurovascular injury and compartment syndrome. The reason was patients were brought after 12, 24, 36 hours from distant areas. So then we had a policy of second look. And that second look, we assessed life threatening injury like head, chest, abdominal trauma, primary by general surgeons who are trauma surgeons and had a diagnostic support, mainly x ray, later on ultrasound and CT. So 71 till 85, 
We had X-ray CT and later ultrasound. But policy of isolation of patient, observation and monitoring, to my mind, was the main thing. And we did that time do life-saving surgery like burr hole, chest tube, and abdominal expiration. But speciality reference was much later instead of in the beginning. So in clinical care, we failed we need to prevent respiratory, renal, hepatic, and metabolic failures in injured patients. Only orthopedic patients don't require, but multiply injured with limb injuries do require. So what was our policy? So far as the respiratory, we had good ventilatory support and monitor PO2, PCO2 acid bed balance. At the same time, at the right time, do a skeletal stabilization because upright posture and rehabilitation supports respiratory, cardiac, and limb motion and prevents catabolism. It is very necessary during that time due to renal monitoring to prevent renal failure. So we used to major serum creatinine, blood urea, urine culture. Hepatic, we used to have enzyme study all the time. So our policy said at that time, now the terminology has come as damage control orthopedics. So we classify into three things, immediate, that is resuscitation, intensive monitoring, acute care, life-saving surgery, repeated revaluation and respiratory support. Then came the intermediate care, but that is assessed every day, not to wait till the time you could say the patient is okay. And during that time, we could do skeletal stabilization and in open injuries and chest and infection control. But we never forgot three more important things, nutritional support, pain control, and rehabilitation during therapy. I think our main problem was severe injuries and pelvic fractures, and they never survived. The minute we had this external fixator, so for my, in my opinion, open injuries, upper limb fractures, and severe pelvic fracture, this was a boon. What did it do? It prevented blood loss, it relieved pain, pressure sores, and if you position your fixator well, you can make the patient stand to have a pulmonary function. <clears throat> Antibiotic, I think we have to be very, very careful and we must have some basic things. We need to know renal toxicity and blood brain barrier. So we laid down in our protocol for head injury. That time we used to use penicillin chloromycin and others we used to use third generation cephalosporin and monogatrocytes. We had a lot of open injuries which came late, so still we use IV metrogel. We do not change antibiotics. We use higher antibiotics in complications after proper analysis. And I still feel that should be a clear cut policy. Pain relief is my opinion is very important thing to convert a catabolic stage into anabolic stage. We always avoid narcotics because they to respiratory depression and sedatives also. We have been using non-opioids and that time transdermal drug therapy. Now we have regional blocks, but that time we used to try, but we never got except for epidural. Now I feel in trauma forgotten part is a nutrition support and pain relief. And we have to see in this patient for early recovery that they have good diet. And I personally feel any hyperalimentation during our time was more exceptional than normal result. This is from 1988 to 92. That is about 31 years ago. Mortality was reduced from 23% in severely injured or polytomized patient to 19%, 4% in five years. We analyzed the mortality within six hours from the highest patient who brought not treated at all and was not looked after but 50%. It was reduced to 5% by 50, just by the protocols I showed you. We also noticed the high mortality was due to no pre-hospital care. Today, we have the pre-hospital care, but it still needs to be improved to a great extent. That's what's my feeling. A poor transportation and no treatment during transportation and head and chest trauma. Pelvic and cervical spine mortality is high. So is the morbidity. 
But understand, skeletal morbidity, our program was 0%. And systemic and skeletal mortality in well-treated case was less than 5%. Well, that time I also said 52 years ago that we must have an organ transplantation. The reason was a dead patient may be lost to the family, but he can give eyes or kidneys or heart or lungs. I thought of that time, but you know, the organization very difficult, but we thought about it that time that we need to do organ. Today it is possible. I think there have been advances, which I am really impressed. The concept of blunt abdominal trauma bat, a first examination, ultrasound examination of four areas to determine whether or not there is a fluid. Perihepatic, perisplenic, pelvic or pericardial makes a lot of, lot of difference. I think imaging and 3D gives you good information how quickly finish the surgical process. Imaging, C arm and O arm have made all the difference, especially cervical spine, lumbar spine injuries and pelvic injuries. So implants, you have so many implants, including the joint replacements. So these advances, in my opinion, are useful, but they don't replace the fundamental understanding of trauma. I was in AO Foundation, and AO Foundation motto was motion is life, life is motion, motion is life. So no disability is final. If you treat the patient well, treat him well, rehabilitate him, counsel him, he can do wonders. So I feel the success in trauma management depends on trauma teams, anesthesia, surgery, orthopedic, trauma protocols, and documentation. I am aware that today world trauma is treated differently because I have been away for last almost 35 years, but I have been reading about it and I am very impressed with it. So. My message is trauma management is not only important to save a life, but to ensure that the efforts help the victim to end up with good quality of life with no or minimal functional disability. My friend Taral Nagda is a living example of well-managed trauma care and a person who desires to participate in the care. It's our job to create a situation where patient reads and gets well himself. Thank you for your attention. So I think clearly what we've heard from Sir uh, is uh, quite mesmerizing. And I think, you know, Sir, the, the seeds you've sowed, uh, you know, uh, half a decade ago, we are reaping the fruit. And I think uh, it's our responsibility for this generation to pass on the similar amount of passion and dedication to the trauma care to the next generation as well. And uh, as as you alluded, uh, you know the the improvement in the technology and the various uh, aspect in trauma care has helped. But I think uh, there is lots to be done to improve the pre-hospital trauma care and the trauma care in the rural areas where the resources are limited and the expertise are also scarce. And that's where I think the Nigel comes into picture with his role as uh, primary trauma care foundation. So I'm going to introduce Nigel Rositer here. Uh, Nigel is a uh, consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, based at Basingstoke. He spent earlier part of his life serving British Army as a trauma surgeon. Uh, he's passionate about the trauma and you would hear his name on various AO uh, courses. Uh, he has been past president of uh, Orthopedic Trauma Society UK. Uh, he is affiliated uh, with the WHO and the Global Surgery Group. And he is uh, he's equally passionate about improving the trauma care, uh, not just in the UK, but worldwide. Uh, over to you, Nigel. Thanks, Ravi. Um, it's, a, it's a massive honor to, uh, to follow on as we say, standing on the shoulders of a giant, uh, to put, follow Professor Loud and uh, and listen to what he was doing 50 years before uh, anyone else and and 15 years before ATLS was even dreamt up of. Uh, so he he is well ahead of everyone. And, and you'll hear lots of what I'm going to say is, is going to reiterate what the prof has just said to you. Um, but uh, uh, showing how we've perhaps moved on a little bit 
but maintaining exactly those same principles, save life, save limb, restore function. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Primary Trauma Care Foundation. And uh, uh, this is a charity that is a UK based charity, but is now global and worldwide. And I'll take you through a little bit of uh, the concept of this and why this is important globally. So um, as you've seen in the title of this presentation, uh, I refer to trauma as the forgotten pandemic. Uh, Ravi referred to this in the introduction. Uh, if you add all contagious diseases together, and that's HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, mumps, uh, measles, and you put COVID with that, the numbers who die from that per year don't come close to the numbers who die from injury. And yet, injury is something that really is not talked about or, or uh, uh, paid a lot of heed to, which is a real travesty. Now we talk about deaths, but actually if you look globally, there are 40 million people a year who get a permanent disability as a result of trauma and 150 million who are temporarily disabled. And that has a massive impact on uh, global domestic product, on GDP. Globally, it's 3%. In the UK, it probably is about 1.5%. But if you go to low resource, low income countries, it could be 10 times that, up to 30% of their global uh, national product is lost because of, of injury. Now, the trouble is, when you start talking about numbers of that size, people tend to zone out. And it's, a, it's an awful fact that uh, something that affects a few people will be much more newsworthy and memorable than lots of people. So let's put that in perspective. We are talking about the death of the entire population of the island of Ireland every year. And we're talking about the entire population of Russia being injured every year. And that happens year on year on year. And that gives you some perspective on how much this is a global issue. Trauma is the leading cause of death in people aged five to 30. And the big problem and the big issue with that is the vast majority of the world has populations under the age of 35. So you're talking about the death of the vast majority of the population in, these, in the countries that have uh, uh, low um, age group uh, populations. And as I've just alluded to, we're talking about deaths, but for every death, there are 97 people who aren't working. And as the prof very eloquently put, um, what we expect in the UK and in, uh, in good centers in India and in other places around the world is not what is expected in other places. There's a beautiful study done by the Vancouver group at the University of Makere in Kampala in Uganda. And they looked at the outcomes of a simple tibial fracture. Now in the UK, if I manage someone with a tibial fracture, that patient expects to be back at work in under six, six weeks time. And we would expect that as well. But in Uganda, if you break your leg in Uganda, it is unusual to get back to work in under 18 months. Within six months, your children are not in school because they're having to go out to work to uh, look after the family. And within 12 months, that family is destitute because of the lack of income. Now, before COVID hit, uh, the numbers of people who died from injury dwarfed all contagious diseases. It was almost twice as much. And yet, 36% of the world's global healthcare funding went into contagious disease and injury got less, uh, got 1% of global healthcare funding. In the last three years since COVID, global healthcare funding to contagious disease has gone up to over 60% and injury now gets well less than 1%. There's something wrong here. As the prof has said, and as many of you know, most of the trauma happens where most people live. And I have a rough rule of 80, that 80% 80 of the world's trauma happens in low and middle income countries. 80% of that trauma affects young people. 80% of those young people uh, are on two wheels. And it's the two wheel trauma that actually uh, contributes the vast majority of the trauma. And this is where the global population is. So you can see where the problems are. 
And uh, yeah, it would be fascinating to give you a talk about how those bubbles will change over the next 50 years. The green and yellow bubbles will actually reduce in size. The big red bubble in China is already reducing in size as it is in Japan. But India and Pakistan's bubble is going to dramatically increase. And the blue bubbles in, in Africa are going to dwarf everyone else. And the coastal region in West Africa is actually going to have more people in 50 years time than there are in the whole world right now. That's a problem. We know that training people to look after trauma is exceedingly cost effective. To train people to, to look after uh, uh, people on the roadside or in ambulances or, or in emergency departments costs just $7 for every quali, every uh, uh, life year that you gain. Now, put that in perspective, that's 130 times less money than it costs for antiretrovirals for HIV. And look at the money that's gone into that. The World Health Organization has shown that half of all deaths and a third of all disability are from things that we can adequately treat by good emergency care, either pre-hospital or in the emergency department. Now, as the prof has just beautifully <coughs> said to you, he was well ahead of the game. Uh, but the thing that, that has changed the world in high income countries is ATLS. Uh, Jim Steiner was a, an orthopedic surgeon involved in an air crash in America in 1976. And out of that air crash and the poor management of his family was born ATLS. And every trainee in any acute speciality, whether it's surgery, orthopedics, anesthetics, emergency medicine in the UK, gets that training at medical school. And the same is true in, in America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and I suspect in many parts of India as well. ATLS has transformed the way that we manage the, the, the patient. And as the prof beautifully said, we go in a systematic way of managing the ABCDE, the airways, breathing, circulation, and then we start to get onto the orthopedic bits. We know from military work now that actually it probably is CABCDE because most of those patients who die at the scene will die from catastrophic hemorrhage and uh, will die from airway um, uh, problems. And by the time they get to hospital, the real problem is catastrophic hemorrhage. But ATLS, although brilliant, is inappropriate for many places in the world. It's exceedingly expensive. It costs about $1,000 for someone to attend the course. And it's very prescriptive in the UK. It is uh, completely written into almost all hospital protocol. That you go from the entrance of the emergency department into a CT scanner. The vast majority of hospitals in the world don't have CT scanners. They don't have blood warmers. They don't have blood. So you need something else. And that's where we come in. Uh, the Primary Trauma Care Foundation was founded just after the prof retired in 1996 and is essentially ATLS for low resource settings. And we're recognized by pretty much almost every major organization globally now. And what's so special about PTC? Well, it's free. Um, uh, there's almost no charge for people to attend the courses or, or a nominal charge. We don't depend on the equipment. We use what is available and appropriate in everyone's location. And we work within people's skill level. So we're not just training doctors, we're training uh, paramedics on the roadside. We're training um, the local population who are not medically trained. And we use local people to do that training and then they cascade that training out and become self-sufficient. So anyone can go on our website, download those materials <clears throat> and, um, uh, and uh, start to do or learn about uh, primary trauma care training. And the way that we've done this traditionally is we do what we call a two one two. So it's a five day course that on the first two days, we'll have 20 people come in and they get trained by a visiting faculty uh, on primary trauma care. And then during those first two days, 10 or 12 of those participants are selected or pre-selected to become instructors. And on day three, they attend a training the trainers course to learn how to teach it. Then day four and day five, those 10 people now become the instructors for another group of 20 people who come in and the visiting initiating faculty sit in the background 
to ensure that the course stays on track and to answer any questions that the new faculty can't answer. So by the end of that, you've got 40 new people trained in PTC and 10 new national instructors, and you can cascade that out. Now we ran this in China um, just over 14 years ago, and you, you can add two zeros to the, to the back of all those numbers. Uh, we trained just under 100,000 people in China in, in 11 months. Now, we recognize that there are not enough people uh, medically trained in the world to provide the medical care around the world. And going to attend a two, three or five day course is actually quite difficult nowadays for anyone, whether you're faculty or someone attending a course. So we can now do this as a modular thing and you can split the course into modules each of those modules can last <clears throat> one or two hours. And so you could do an hour or two a week over a 10 week period and cover the whole of the PTC course. And again, that's downloadable off the website. So since 1996, Primary Trauma Care is now the, the leading trauma educational course in low resource settings. And I run this in 84 countries around the world. Um, we have uh, representatives from every continent that feed into us to make sure that we stay on track and make sure we stay current. Uh, but yeah, we are pretty busy. And as I just said, um, we've trained at least 100,000 people. I've got hard data on that. I don't know if that's nearly a million people or more. We run about 160 courses a year. And as I said, we're in 84 countries. But COVID has shown us that uh, the world has moved forward. And most of you, like we're doing right now, have got used to attending webinars and doing things in a digital fashion. And so we're in a partnership right at this moment with uh, the Intuitive Foundation in America and Apropedia, uh, that most of you will be familiar with Wikipedia. Apropedia is the, uh, um, the digital platform on which Wiki Wikimedia, Wikipedia is based. And we're about to put primary trauma care training uh, onto the web that will be completely digitally available. And we're also developing an app to make it interactive. You can download it, do it offline. There will be live mentoring, animation, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. So watch this space. I hope a year from now, uh, we will be well and truly in the 21st century. Now, as the prof has very eloquently said, um, there is more to it than just uh, uh, looking after people and scraping them off the road. Um, and advocacy for trauma sort of falls into a number of categories. The first, obviously, is prevention. And there are lots and lots of, of uh, good work around the world talking about prevention. The real challenge is getting individual governments to prioritise prevention over other things that they are, are, are a pull on their economy. We then have to sort out uh, the initial management of those patients when they, they reach a medical facility and on the roadside. And that's where primary trauma care comes in. But as you know, um, delivering a live patient out of the emergency department is one thing, but then they go into somewhat variable institutions to have the life-saving surgery. And that can be very variable around the world. And then from there, we then have to sort out looking after those patients in hospital on wards, making sure that, that all our infection control principles are good. As the prof so eloquently said, we get people up and we get them going so they become contributors to society more quickly. And that is very, very variable. And the great big hole that uh, no one in the world has, has uh, managed to uh, sort out is rehabilitation, is making sure that we get people who have suffered injury back to be contributors to society and to their families in a timely and effective manner. And that is probably the biggest challenge we face yet. Now in the UK, um, uh, I was part of a group uh, over the last 30 years who've been really banging on about this. And this report came out in 2007, following lots of other reports, um, uh, that was uh, presented to government. And fortunately, with a bit of serendipity, we changed how we run trauma care in the UK. And if you look at survival in trauma in England, 
uh, it almost mirrors my career. So I attended the very first ATLS course in the UK in 1989. And, um, and ATLS transformed some of the way that we manage trauma and certainly made a difference to the, the uh, survivability. In the early part of this century, NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence was born and the head injury guidelines came into place and that also made a difference. But our trauma networks went live in 2010 and we accredited every single hospital in the UK in three levels of care. Major trauma centers where there are trauma teams there 24 hours a day, 365 days a year with every single speciality available what we call trauma units, which are level two hospitals, where there are trauma teams, but not necessarily all the specialities like neurosurgery, plastic surgery, vascular surgery, and then local receiving hospitals that don't have um, trauma teams available. So the paramedics on the roadside can triage those patients to the right hospital. And today, your chance of surviving a serious injury with an ISS of over 25 in the UK is almost 20% greater than it was uh, um, 10 years ago. And it costs the economy 30% less. So that is, an, that is an achievement. The issue, unfortunately, is that is not true globally. Um, in 1999, the World Health Organization and the UN came out with 17 sustainable development goals, and goal number three was around healthcare, and that we would achieve all of this for the world by 2020. Well, by 2014, it was pretty obvious that global access to good surgical obstetric trauma and anesthetic care was not going to be achieved. And out of that, an organization called the G4 Alliance was born, and I sit on that. And we're trying to make sure that these are all going to be available, accessible, acceptable, and good quality by 2030. The World Health Organization is involved in all of this. Uh, after a, a, a bit of a hiatus, four years down the line, um, uh, the Global Alliance for Care of the Injured, what's called GACI, um, has just restarted. We have our first meeting in next week in Geneva and I sit on the board of that, and we hope that will start to make a bit of a difference globally as well. But if you want to go and watch an, an amazing documentary on this, uh, you can look at this on YouTube or just go onto the web and go onto traumahealers.org, and that will tell you lots about the global problem of where we are, uh, what is going on, and what we can do to make things better. It's a fascinating documentary. However, um, we do have an issue. There are 8 billion people in the world and 5 billion of them don't have access to surgery, obstetric, trauma or anaesthetic care. And the great travesty is at the World Health Association meeting in Geneva last year that I attended, there was not a single SOTA topic, not a single surgery, obstetric, trauma or anaesthetic topic on the WHA agenda. That is an unforgivable travesty, and that needs to change because um, prioritization of global healthcare at the moment is, is wrong. It needs to change. We're driven, unfortunately, by money and pharma in contagious disease, and contagious disease is not the greatest problem in global healthcare. So if you want to read about that, yeah, I can bore you with that paper I wrote um, last year. But it is an unfortunate fact that trauma is the single largest unaddressed global healthcare issue. And we really urge you to do something about it. Now, there we go. I hope that uh, puts you into global perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, I think it was a great talk and it just kind of uh, 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 blended very well with what uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Larcher has uh, told us and it gives us a perspective. There is lots more to be done from individual healthcare professional. And I think, as I said earlier, we have to take responsibility for improving the trauma care worldwide. And as you said, you know, this course is free, but, you know, uh, and people, people uh, called me and said, how can you arrange a, a free course uh, for such an important topic? 
but i said it's not free because you know the person who's involved in the trauma could be your brother sister or mother father your son and you can't put value uh, to the human life so it's it's probably i think the price this course uh now uh moving forward from what you've told uh, uh nigel i'm going to kind of introduce uh, melinda uh, uh who's on panel and melinda is going to give us uh, her perspective on uh, uh, her role managing trauma in Malawi. So Melinda is a specialist in emergency medicine at Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital Malawi. Uh, she's a founding head of, for the first modernized adult emergency department in Malawi as well. She holds a very important position as an advisory to the African board for the emergency medicine. Uh, she is an active member of Primary Trauma Care Foundation and as a course coordinator as well as instructor. Uh, she holds a role as a senior lecturer at uh, Kamuzu University of Health Science and played a significant role in managing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Malawi as well. Uh, over to you, Melinda. <laughs> Uh, Ravi, it's a pleasure to join you all on this uh, wonderful Sunday and talk about this forgotten pandemic. And my role here is to bring up the, a new specialty that uh, Prof uh, can be um, recognized from the history that Prof uh, Loud has talked about uh, in trauma care, that is emergency medicine that is currently doing front door emergency care before definitive care has been um, instituted. So I come from a country that is very small and is part of the low income countries that is struggling with a health system that works on a very low uh, health budget. It's simple, um, relaying patient care according to a WHO global uh, low income, middle and income country system where we have the majority of our patients going to um, health facilities, which are health centers, and they tend to be where no doctors are and may be managed by health surveillance assistants and community aid um, uh, responders. So we're still far back in finding injuries being managed by mainly unskilled health professionals who are doing an amazing job, but we need to improve on it. Then those of us who are like specialists tend to be found in the smaller group of hospitals that are found in district hospitals. So like I'm uh, found in the biggest uh, central hospital that has is a teaching institution and has led in improving trauma care in our situation. It's pertinent for me because we use the primary trauma care course as a very good course to help all of us who are uh, offering trauma care from the orthopedic surgeon to the anesthetist, to the nurse, uh, to the emergency care practitioners, and I'll talk about our different cadres who were trained in, on PTC, to be able to marry how can we do things basically without being complex and using very few things. A bit about our, our um, um, in, epidemiology so that you can understand what I'm dealing with or our team is dealing with is that our adult trauma is mainly for the young. Our population is very young with majority being under 30s and they're the productive group of people walking around trying to find money and as well as livelihoods on the um, um, roads of Malawi. And we're seeing more males, that's why, because they are more migratory and more looking for economic um, outputs. And they tend to have quite a lot of um, pertinent uh, injuries that are related to risk. So this is either road traffic accidents, which are on the increase as uh, highlighted by Nigel, the incidence of having lots of um, uh, the industrialization is causing the, the efflux of um, motorcycles on our road sites. So we're having seen an influx of motorcycle accidents, but we also have falls, assaults that tend to come and the, they would be the ones that would require admission. But you can see that road traffic accidents 
are contributing to the majority of the injuries that are being seen in our hospitals and requiring definitive care where orthopedics, surgery would be involved. For pediatrics, the difference is that you find road traffic accidents are high, but um, we look at falls, looking at the nature of children and um, their ability to play. And we've got a lovely nature here with uh, many children able to play and climb trees. So falls tend to be frequent. And burns are seasonal, so we see them in the cold season. So what do our primary trauma care uh, participants say about their trauma system that responds to these injuries? If you can see, our system is struggling. It has uh, reduced ability. Uh, most uh, of our participants say they're sort of functioning uh, with as much as they can, but they haven't achieved the level at which we should have a good trauma care compared to how this would translate to infectious disease, where would we have excellence for malaria and uh, maybe also HIV related care. So it's very important to realize what we're saying is that the need for investing in, in, in injury care or trauma care system components is important. You can see poorly defined management pathways, and we're still struggling with pre-hospital care in our setups, where we don't have a national um, emergency care system. Uh, we have a pilot program that is uh, responding to injuries on our main road, but has not been rolled out throughout the country. What about the things that we need to Im improve? And these are basic uh, resources supplies and equipment that are required. And I've, we've highlighted these resources because the PTC course is focused on making sure that we have low, low, low tech, but highly skilled ability to respond to emergency care in a systematic way of the ABCDE approach. But you can see that most of our facilities where our, respond, our trainees had come from, and I will highlight here that these are central hospitals, what we say are tertiary care uh, hospitals. They are struggling as much. So QECH, KCH, and MCH are central hospitals. They are struggling, but it's even worse in district hospitals where the majority of the injured people are. The private is also struggling and therefore shows that there's a need to invest in trauma care supplies and equipment. And you can see that spinal injuries are a major issue in which we talk about. When we look at human resource in terms of where primary trauma care actually impacts the trauma care system in our setups, we see that the respondents are all talking about the, lack, the inadequate staff that are available. People are working long hours. They're making the most of what they need to do. There's reduced um, supervision or minimal senior uh, support in terms of how they can improve in trauma care. And you can see that there are no dedicated trauma teams in most of our facilities. So people are multitasking between looking after injuries and uh, uh, as well as uh, illnesses, as emergencies. And that requires the balance of how much attention a patient can get when they come into our facilities. So primary trauma care course being basic and uh, highlighting on the adaptability and uh, contextualization of the course facilitated us uh, to be able to harmonize how we look after patients from the very well-trained patient, uh, trained uh, health personnel, the highest being a, a, a specialist, to those that are not trained as much, but learn how to um, respond to injuries as, um, as we go along. So you can see in our primary trauma care course, we've used it to actually train quite a number of general practitioners, uh, and I will emphasize in Malawi, we did a lot of uh, training for um, clinical staff rather than nursing staff, which is the next um, um, slide here.
But over the years, we've started slowly introducing this course to nurses. And um, you can see about 24% uh, of our trainees so far in the um, um, census that I've done for the courses that we've provided are nurses that came into the course. And we can say that we have been, uh, it's been appreciated how the course improves the knowledge and skills, especially for nurses and other lower, uh, other cadres, not lower, but rather uh, less trained uh, clinicians in our setup. And I intentionally put this slide because the delivery of injury care in our setup is mainly done by non-doctor trained personnel in our setup. So they're called clinical officers and medical assistants. And they are the majority of health workers that you'll find in our facilities. So this course has been shown to be very useful, impacting um, uh, more of the health personnel in their knowledge, attitude, and practice in how they look after injured patients. As you can see, 39% uh, are pertinent. For the specialty trainee that are the second largest group, it's related to how on our continent, uh, um, under the college that trains special uh, surgery, um, specialties. Um, the trainees um, are mandated to go through the primary trauma care course before they go on to the adult advanced life support course um, before they do their part one exam. And this has been very helpful because when we're training special specialists, they should be relevant to the context that they work in and they should relate to the team members that they work with. So it has been helpful to see surgical specialists, uh, uh, trainees, and now even some of them have graduated, translating basic primary trauma care course um, ethos and system uh, to uh, areas where they may be the only specialist and then have to work with other medical cadres. So it's important to say that courses must actually impact areas where people have a need. Otherwise, it is useless for us to run courses and not offer the appropriate knowledge, skill, and practice that helps them to improve. So we saw that even when we evaluated, uh, this was prior to the training, um, the competencies that people can uh, see in terms of how the health personnel are responding to um, injuries, the course itself, the primary trauma care course, does actually provide the ability to meet the needs or the deficiencies that the health worker actually identifies as a need uh, or an issue where they should respond to in, in injury care. And this is very insightful because we can see how our health workers actually know what is the deficiency and know how they can provide it. So what's good about the primary trauma care course? Rather than sit in a lecture for a long time, we have these short lectures, which in our setup have shown that are good for clarifying controversies in the various authorities that teach injuries, whether it is specialization or the area of global training where you come from. The PTC course provided the generalized way of clarifying these controversies. But the systematic evaluation was significant. It allows the adult learner, as well as the experience provider, to recalculate how they can actually look after a patient. And this is best done when, and this is about the course, is that much as we want to use it as a modular course uh, and being done electronically, we would encourage that we still also have practical sessions because the highlight of the course is always when people work together in a team and they do scenario simulation. And then everything comes into place and people understand where they had to have to improve their skills or application of knowledge, or just simply how they've actually been thinking about things. So the attitude itself. So skills are appreciated and the primary trauma care course has helped us to also reach out to staff who have never been exposed to the pertinent skills like inserting a chest drain, intubating, or even just simply managing an airway. So we see that the primary trauma care course has been useful in our setup, providing 
global standards in which we can use basic skills, equipment and supplies, but also advocating for key components related in trauma care management, major incident planning, where we are actually overwhelmed to respond to trauma. In the resource limited setting, we prepare ourselves within the trauma uh, uh, care, uh, primary trauma care course, how we can prepare for this with simple equipment and also um, um, adjusting to how we can actually improve in um, um, actually relaying tasks. But also advocacy was another important component for training within the facilities, but also creating teamwork among specialties that respond to injuries, as well as also creating a network of interfacility uh, referral, as well as uh, mentorship programs for um, trauma. So this is what we've been able to achieve with trauma. And it is always a delight to say, we are moving forward in terms of injury care in these very um, countries where um, the trauma care is improving, we're saying, we can do much and uh, it just takes a course like this. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, uh, thank you, Melinda. That was a really a great talk and that just highlighted uh, how much this course has helped uh, the population in Malawi, uh, especially when you have limited resources available, not skill-wise, but financially as well. And I'm glad that you've taken this on a board and serving the humanity by using the knowledge which have, you've acquired with these courses. So uh, we've, I'm going to introduce our next uh, uh, speaker here, uh, Dr. Taral. Uh, Taral is a pediatric uh, orthopedic surgeon based in uh, uh, Thane. He's a director of uh, Jupiter uh, uh, CP clinic and also runs uh, the gate analysis lab there. Uh, he is very popular, not uh, amongst the patient, but uh, their parents as well, uh, because he is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Uh, <laughs> and Taral is going to give us uh, uh, his perspective as a patient when he was involved in a road traffic accident and how he managed his initial care by himself and the care he received afterward. Over to you, Taral. Yeah. Thanks, Ravi. And uh, 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 so I don't have slides, but you know, there's something else I prepared and I hope you can see this. So we have the, you know, uh, excellent uh, talks. We had L for Dr. Lard and then we had M for Melinda. And then that was for Nigel N and then Auto TV is O and Ravi, that's U R, And that leaves behind Q, that's questions. A lot of questions here. I'll go through some of the experiences which I had as a patient. You know, a lot of experience all of us have as doctors, as orthopedic surgeons, as trauma caregivers uh, to save lives and limbs and uh, put patients back, uh, you know, into an, uh, a productive life. But, uh, you know, I did that for 20 years, but it was completely different when I experienced the whole scenario from the other side. The situations on the road are completely different. You may have best of the hospitals, trauma centers, training, everything. But what happens before the patient reaches Sion Hospital or Mulinda's Hospital or Nigel, you know, to a primary trauma center is very, very important. Uh, also, what is important is once the patient is discharged from a hospital facility, once all the surgeries are done, is also very important. And I, I'm sure that if, we, if our aim is finally to reduce the mortality and morbidity. What happens before the hospital and what happens after the hospital is also very, very important. And uh, I'm gonna put three points here. And these three points are training, transportation and trauma rehab, the three T's. And uh, let me go through this uh, one by one. You know, in life, uh, you know, we, are, we are trained for success. We are all orthopedic surgeons, we are doctors. You know, we are trained to get good marks in the exams. We are trained to, you know, score well, talk well, present well on podiums like this. But no one trains us for disasters. In our schools, we are taught how to get good marks in 
history and geography and know about first world war and second world war but if there is a disaster situation a person who got 98 percentile in his ssc he, he cannot deal with uh, you know these disasters that's the tragedy tragedy of our you know uh, education system i i feel that uh, changes uh, need to made here first you know every person who graduates uh, who passes high school and then graduates there has to be a basic primary care trauma care and disaster care given to each and every citizen and we must make a rule that unless you know the person passes that minimum training uh, and knowledge you know he will not be given a college certification or a, a, a an employment every person uh, should have this degree and it this should be mandatory for each and every one because when you get hurt you and your co passenger sometimes are the only people on the road uh, when i we had an accident we faced a lot of difficulties the first difficulty was our, uh, our seat belts got jammed it was difficult to get out the door gets locked you know evacuation is a problem uh, uh, people around don't know how to help there is a there was a police who came uh, uh, you know around the only thing he did was you know dial some emergency number and call for an ambulance the police did not have basic necessary training to help a person uh, who has undergone an accident there were people on the road but nobody could help now being a doctor you know we could initiate a series of actions and got us self shifted very safely to a hospital and 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 i help that if there is some training which goes on to help yourself or your co passenger view you, when you have an accident or help others when you are on the road and there is an accident that also would be a very important part of the program i think few people which need to be trained and i i know that dr lard uh, he is a visionary and he started this program i know that at sain hospital they started a program he and uh, uh, joy patankar to train the police people to help people the railway police i remember dr lard started the program to know what are the injuries the basics of airway breathing and circulation was told, was taught to the police and i think we should you know all the national association should plead to the government that police people people at the petrol stations and people who are working at the uh, the restaurants which are roadside we call it as daba they should they are the first line uh, sort of uh, uh, support systems and they should be told how to you know take care of this the second issue i feel are our roads and transportation you know uh, uh, the road where i had an accident every day 180 accidents happen on that 20 km stretch of road we had uh, some big celebrities uh, you know which had an accident which were you know within 20 kilometers and they still continue to happen today the road conditions have not improved uh, there are you know very strict laws for doctors if you do something wrong you know you are penalized for the road constructions and the accidents happening because of poor road facilities uh, and repair works going on you know there is no penalty no one even corrects these even even if you write to the government so this this is something i would like to improve you know the road should have an audit and the accident prone places you know within 6 months you know those the architecture of those uh, road should be changed which is something which is uh, very important i also feel that uh, you know we have modern cars now ashish we have cars with uh, you know gps and uh, internet ready cars but there are no cars those who have App- apple airplay and you know you have uh, android the uh, Uh, online but there are no cars where you can simply have a button you have an accident you press that button and somebody will come to know that you are in danger that doesn't happen it is possible to set up these systems in auto mode sudden if there is a crash automatically the hospitals and the doctors and the police around will be informed that there is an accident and reach immediately to the site of accident you know such facilities can easily be created and uh, you know people who are uh you know uh in orthopedic circles you know in societies uh, bombay orthopedic society the indian orthopedic association the british uh, orthopedic society and several societies uh, where people are listening to this webin- webinar today they should plead 
to the government that it, they should make it mandatory uh, for all the cars to have such a facility where uh, an emergency or a panic button or automated such responses are available. And I don't think it's very difficult to do that. I, I think it's important that every car should have a kit which has a small knife to cut the uh, safety belt in case you have an accident. Uh, you should have a small hammer where you can you know, uh, uh, hammer the glass pan so that evacuation is possible. So every car should be equipped uh, with these equipments, a small kit, a, a disaster management kit, and it should be part of every vehicle. So this is what I feel uh, is about transportation. And uh, last thing, what I really feel about is, is trauma rehab. Because, uh, you know, doing a good surgery, saving the patient, good, uh, uh, good doing a good CPR is just not enough. A person which has been operated for a compound femur fracture or a vascular injury or a nerve injury or a pelvic trauma or a spinal cord injury like me needs an active rehabilitation. And it doesn't go on for a week or two weeks or two months. It requires years of rehabilitation to put that person back onto what he wants to do in life. So it's very essential that we also simultaneously build up trauma rehab departments in our medical colleges and uh, you know uh, in-house rehab departments in every districts which are affordable which are accessible and uh, which can make a person who are, who is a survivor to be a functionally you know close to normal individual so these were my thoughts uh, you know based on my experience ravi uh, these are not uh, thoughts which I had ever experienced as a doctor, but this have come, uh, you know, from actually having a first-hand experience of what goes on on the accident scene. Thank you very much for inviting me, yeah. Ravi, uh, Ashish, uh, Auto TV, Doctor Lard, and everybody, uh, and to allow me to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taral. Thank you for sharing your first and experience as a patient, and it's a very unique experience, isn't it? We all talk about being empathetic. But, you know, you just go through the whole sequence of event and managing it by yourself on the road when people around you are helpless because they don't have a knowledge, uh, although they want to help, but they don't have enough knowledge. And that's where I think uh, what uh, 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 Lard sir has said uh, as a visionary uh, 50 years ago and what uh, Nigel is doing through the mode of a PTCA and what Mulinda is doing in Malawi, it's a very important. I think we need to... Uh, uh, forget the geographical uh, barriers. We need to uh, kind of uh, share knowledge. We need to uh, have a coordinated effort across the globe to improve the primary trauma care. And if you if you look at uh, just from India's point of view, uh, uh, Taral and Larsar and Ashish, uh, India is ranked number one country in the number of people killed by the road traffic accidents across all 270 countries. And you know, if you look at the fatality is one third of the road traffic accidents are turning out to be fatal, uh, you know, kind of a life taking injuries. So it's a very concerning thing. Uh, now there are a few questions which have got, uh, so I think, uh, so I think, uh, 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 so question to large sir, sir, uh, I think what Taral said, do you think we should make the primary trauma care as a mandatory part of the school curriculum now? And do you think the government should take this on a board? Awareness should be created right from kindergarten to the college. And I think the people who need to be made aware of the internet loss are the prime ministers of all countries. Because when he gets sick, he travels to Scandinavia, United States. I think this is a primary training. I was very impressed with what Melinda said. If it can happen in Nigeria, can't it happen in Mumbai and in Delhi? So the whole thing is a psych. We are so obsessed with development, development. The development has to be basic structure and development of mind. That human life today is cheap. Everything else is expensive. We need to change our the human life is most essential because loss of human resources is unrepairable, unrepairable, and particularly skilled. You know, in Malawi and even in UK, look at the population, earning population. 
They're hitting the individual, the family, the society, and the state. Today, we are so upset with big express highways and big cars. I am afraid that we are controlled by the market forces. Let us control them and tell them, guys, make money. But 5% of what you earn, 5% of all you were all over shall go. It will be distributed to each country where the car is sold. Today you are making mandatory for all other things. Why can't you do it? Where is the insurance money goes? Because the chief drives in Mercedes Benz and young motorcyclists who suffers get nothing. I think we need to change and I agree with Taral. This is the basic training. Young minds, if you train them, my experience, you might to tell them about school days, you know they will get a habit. Today you see an action of the road, you don't stop, right? First thing you should do, you should stop. But today, see, is take a photograph, they'll find out their camera and start taking pictures. But nobody will work. I think this is for me, this is a very enlightening experience. I joined this program after, I, I don't know, about 20 years. But uh, I, I can do one thing. You want all the information, I'll be prepared to give you, whatever I have. I don't know how many years I have. I don't carry it up, but I can give it to you. But I absolutely agree that we need to apologize. What Nigel said is correct. If we are losing billions and billions and billions, when are we going to wake up? Excellent. I think you're right, it's sir. Only, I think and I agree. Human manufacture. And COVID is a big myth, I tell you. It's a scam. Wait for a few days. Wait for a few days and it will link to the big pharmaceuticals. So I'm not against, but I personally feel something needs to be done because, see, I always say not the life, but quality of life. And Taral said, no. My principle in Sion Hospital was the rehabilitation starts the minute I restore the airway. I start moving his limbs the same day. Otherwise, you end up with a equinus and deformed hand for IV. Rehabilitation should start the minute you put your hands on the pulse. Get a guy to work on it. And you will see the quantum recovery. We did an ex experiment of using protocol. My orthopedic polytrauma stay was four weeks. We brought it down to 11 days. 11 days. And the guy was at work with olden tools. So you don't need modern technology. You need innovation. What you said is right. What Nigel said is right. Use the things available. Why do you put a bamboo and tie to a fracture femur and transport him? Why don't you get a very fancy splint? So until you realize that, he will do it. I will tell you, they are very intelligent people. And my fear, my fear is rural trauma, agriculture trauma is another biggest challenge to this world. I think it would be very interesting. I thank you, Ravi, that you remember your old Galik. And of course, Taral is always very exciting. But Nigel and Melinda, I think I enjoyed your lecture and thank you very much. For me, it was an excellent experience. And I think and you're I right, sir. I think any time, please do let me know. And, okay. and as you Nigel said, uh, uh, sir, thank you very much. Uh, so, Nigel, I think what would you expect a country like India to support the primary trauma care? What sort of things from your angle you would like people to be involved in? Well, actually, primary trauma care is very, very active in India. Um, Aaron was on this call. Uh, our, our coordinator for PTC in the whole of Asia is Aaron Prasad, uh, who is based in New Delhi. And uh, uh, PTC is actually extremely active in India. There are some regions where we still <clears throat> would like to go into in India. Uh, other regions are, are very well uh, supported. So all you have to do is <clears throat> contact us through the website. And uh, Aaron, there, there's a big faculty team in India uh, Aaron's team can can get that faculty team out to you. That that isn't an issue. Um, uh, it, it, it's just knowing 
as I, <clears throat> as I have called myself over the last two or three years, I'm just an international dating app. Uh, all I do is put people in contact with people to make sure that things can happen. And, and it, it, it works. So it's just word of mouth and it, and it will get out there. I'll just quickly expand on something that the prof just said. Um, we shouldn't get angry about the fact that injury and trauma is the Cinderella, is the, the thing in global healthcare that is being overlooked at the moment. Yes, it annoys me, but actually we should learn from uh, contagious disease uh, as to how they've got all that global healthcare funding. Uh, if we learn how to, to make use of their advocacy and get people to, to concentrate on what really are the global healthcare issues, we will get it up to the top of the agenda. And the prof is absolutely right, money talks. But we have to learn from the successful projects out there like HIV, how they became so successful to make something that is a much, much bigger global problem even more successful. I think you're right, uh, Nigel. Uh, I think uh, we are we are we are contributing towards uh, what we can. I think we need to expand and go beyond what we do uh, in our home front. I think what Mulinda is doing in uh, uh, Malawi, I think, should be expanded to uh, other African countries and other South American countries where the resources are limited. Uh, so, just a question to Taral. Taral, uh, if if you wouldn't have been a trauma surgeon involved in an uh, accident. What would have been the outcome of the accident you were involved in? So, can you please repeat with the question? So, I'm if clear about consider that. you wouldn't have been a trauma surgeon when you were involved in accident, you have been a, just a common man. What would have been the outcome with the kind of accident you are involved in? I really don't know because maybe I wouldn't be here to talk to all of you. Um, <laughs> Because I also had a radial artery injury. Uh, so a lot of things happened because uh, I was a doctor. Firstly, I knew how to transport myself and my wife. Most importantly, I had a mobile phone which was on. And I could just quickly type, you know, the place where I, we had an accident, which was Vapi, an orthopedic surgeon. And a number appeared of Akhilesh Patel, uh, who has uh, come to Bombay Orthopedic Society so many times. And I just called him up and he arranged everything within five minutes for us to be transported to hospital. He suggested what hospital we should go to. A very well-equipped hospital just five minutes away from where we had an accident. But, you know, if I was not an orthopedic surgeon, I would have been taken to a, uh, some other primary trauma center, which where the police wanted me to go and not to a well-equipped trauma hospital where specialists were available. And, you know, then, you know, all of, you know, statistics are statistics. But when you, for a person, it's it's hundred percent. It's not thirty percent or fifty percent. If you, uh, you know, uh, have an incidence, so things would have been different. But what I really want is that uh, it should not make a difference. So tomorrow, any person has an accident of civil nature at the same spot, whether he's a doctor, whether he's an orthopedic surgeon, or some other doctor or a lay person. Whether it's a child or a you know uh, adult person, they should get the same standard of care yeah. everywhere, and this includes care before the hospital, care in the hospital, and care after the hospital. I think that should be the aim. And uh, Nigel very well spoke that you know we should learn from contagious diseases. The polio eradication program, you know, supported by government, WHO, Rotary. So if you have an accident prevention program, accident mobility and mortality prevention program, which is global, which is accepted by all governments, WHO, the non-government organizations, supported by Rotary and Lions Club, and funded, as Dr. Lard suggested, by insurance companies and people who make the vehicles and people who make the roads, then it, it's going to happen. Thanks, so PTC, uh, PTC should not be an event. It should become a habit. You know, it should yeah. be a routine. And, and and that's correct. And that's the whole mission of the Primary Trauma Care Foundation. I think you know, whosoever is listening to this webinar, we are happy to answer any questions okay. and any inquiries. If you visit uh, the Primary Trauma Care Foundation, I think uh, I'm going to. Uh, 
conclude conclude this session by saying thanks to all the speakers here i think we've we've got the pearls of wisdom from the experience of large sir nigel uh, mulinda's hard work in malawi and taral's own experience i'm going to thank uh, ashish for getting the bombay orthopedic society on board to support this as well as the ortho tv uh, with neeraj and uh, ashok so many thanks to you all uh, for giving your precious time on sunday and listening to this webinar uh, thank you thank you everybody thanks Okay. Poonam. Well done all. Thank you very much for letting us partake. Yeah, no, I think it's good, Nigel. I think it was a good uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, talk giving an insight into what we're doing. So it was uh, very well, I think, uh, received. Thank you. Yep. Well organized. Thank well, ha have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Melinda. Thanks, Taral. Bye, 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 everyone.